Our passage this morning is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. And if you didn't see it, I, yeah, that's good. I, I, I've been trying, I'm telling Jeff I need to do a better job of slowing down a little bit so he can see. It's unity. What's love got to do with it? So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the full measure of of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So just quickly remember where we've been since I started back at the end of the month and talking about the head, the heart, and the hand and how they all work in conjunction about our mind, the, the battle that we are all facing every day in the mind, and that it starts there, and that what we believe, what we say, what we profess to believe out of our mind, if it does not soak down into the heart, it lives, it leads us to hypocritical living, because we don't truly believe it. And then to express this, we talked about James's words last week out in, in his book, or in his epistle, about the fact that these, this faith that we have, this faith that has seeped down through the mind, to the heart, is only clearly displayed through what we do, through those good deeds. And we talked about, again, these deeds do not save us, but that we were saved for these deeds. So, that leads us to this. What does that look like in the church? What does that mean for us in terms of this idea of unity? So, the human body is an amazing thing. Each muscle is perfectly designed and placed to serve its function in unity with the surrounding muscles. And they do it so effectively that you can accomplish complex tasks like walking, jumping, talking, and you don't even think about it. They just function. And the only time you begin to realize it is when they aren't functioning like they should. When a muscle weakens, by the way, those of you don't know this about me, but I have a PE minor, and so I had to go through anatomy and physiology class, and I dreaded every moment of it. But one of the things, one of the things that I remember very clearly was this talk about the, the human body and the muscles and how they how they support one another. So this this was something that I still hold on to a lot to this day. So when a muscle weakens, the surrounding muscles have to step in, and they work even harder to try to compensate. In the beginning, this is an admiral, a very admirable thing that happens. Because they're trying to share the burden. However, over time, if the weakened muscle does not regain the strength that it, that it needs, then the surrounding muscles will eventually weaken and uh, 
and, 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 and misfunction as well, or not be able to function to capacity because they were never created to do that. So I imagine for a minute, what if muscles had minds? If muscles could actually speak, what would they be thinking? And so I thought during this time, these surrounding muscles might be swelling up with pride, saying, look at us, we are doing the work of the knee. The knee is not functioning, therefore I am, we are lifting it up. And they might even begin to think, I don't even, I don't even need this muscle anymore. We can do it ourselves, and we're doing it better. But then they gradually realize over time that their work is going to falter because the body has been thrown out of whack. It's not a stretch to say that our country is extremely divided. Between the issues of racism, hatred towards law enforcement, COVID-19, sexual permissiveness, words and actions filled with vitriol, an overwhelming unwillingness to listen to one another, and a general refusal to accept absolute truth. The word chaos seems to be at the tip of everyone's tongue. Whether this is true or not is up to debate, but I have heard it said quite often that we are as divided as we've ever been as a nation. Unfortunately, the church is not exempt from seeing this division show up. People are crying out for a unifying force to step in and fill the void. We need the unity which Jesus prayed for for believers about in John chapter 17. He said this, My prayer is not for the apostles alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The unity between the Father and Son conveys Jesus with a heart of total submission, complete trust, and total connectedness. And Jesus prays that God would grant this same unity to the church. So where's the church at in this time of division? Why has our response been so meek? Perhaps we attempt to chalk it up to growing persecution that we are facing in the West. And while there is definitely some truth to that, we still maintain a majority of our freedoms. There's something more going on here as to where the church is. And it was explained very clearly to me a couple of years ago by a, a, a pastor. He was retired, but he was attending the church where I was serving at as a discipleship pastor. That's probably been, I guess, four or five years ago. And he said this. And he's talking about the church. He's not just talking about the world. He says, when you attempt to find unity within the Western church right now, it is impossible. Because you raise any issue, and you will elicit a thousand different responses, or a thousand different voices saying a thousand different things. The message that we hear from the church as a whole, as a large, is very uh, not unified. We are very divided amongst um, doctrinal, or doctrinal beliefs, practices. And so where do we go from there? How do we seek to biblically unify the church? And what's our role in that? I, I believe the church in many ways has lost its, uh, its way in regards to the unity of Jesus. Too often, we are majoring in the minors. 
Our pride in attempting to win the minor battles has replaced the joy that happens when we fight alongside one another in prayer. And with the armor of God, as we mentioned, I think, two weeks ago, that it's through those spiritual battles that we walk with one another and that spiritual growth where unity is possible. We must find a way to get out of the muck that we ourselves get caught up in Because it's easy to engage a fight. It seems to me that everybody today wants to pick a fight. Or not engage at all. Just disengage and say, I don't want anything to do with it. And I don't think that's the answer either. But instead, we need to find a way to lead in this conversation in a way that cares about the unity that Jesus is talking about. That we, you know, if we talk about this body, that we are one. So my sermon in a sentence is this. Unity within the church reveals God's love for the world and reveals the truth that the Father sent the Son and loved them even as the Father has loved the Son. Which is a passage piece right out of the scripture that I just read. So how can we find unity in such a tumultuous time? First, We need to recognize that Christian unity occurs when our lives are centered on the truth. In John chapter 18, verse 37, when Jesus is standing before Pilate, he proclaims, The reason I was born and came into the world was to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Here, Jesus is connecting lowercase t, truth, with capital, or uppercase t, truth, which is him. When the truth is highly valued amongst the group, unity is easily, or is easier to come by. One of the biggest ways to destroy unity, and we're seeing this tremendously in this country, is when our ability to discern truth is diminished. Example A of this division is what we're seeing going on in our country. There's been a shift in our world with regards to the topic of truth. I wanted to go back kind of as far as I could find. I didn't want something even this year, even though usually you think I want updated stats. But as far back as 2002, Barna suggested that only one-fifth of the adults in this country believed in absolute truth. In the church, or let me clarify that. Born again, people that would profess to be born again believers, one third believe in absolute truth. The belief in universal truths for many has changed or been replaced by this idea of relative truth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. The phrase fake news is simply the current way that Americans express things that, are, that they are in disagreement with. So let me go off scripture again for just a second. That when we have that mindset, this is one of those moments again in the, in where we find ourselves as a country. If we want to make a difference, if we want to make a difference within the lives of the people around us, we need to start within our own hearts and ask ourselves, do we believe that, God's, that what God said is what God means? Do we know what God said about some issue? Or are we talking, are we taking the political points that we hear that, that, that sound good, that seem like they line up with Scripture and go with them. So much of what I think the church's meekness comes from is uh, it's an unwillingness to engage the Word. It's an unwillingness to engage one another. It's an unwillingness to stop and just listen to other people and realize we all have our differences, and yet our differences don't have to be the thing that keeps us apart. Consider the story of Ananias and Sapphira. So if you don't know the story, again, I'm going to just give you the quick, the quick run through the story. Ananias had some land, and he sold it because the other believers were doing the same in many cases. And in Acts 4, we learn that the believers were sharing everything. They were in kind of this unified or united state. So they decide, we're going to do the same. But they 
come up with a scheme and they decide they're going to sell the property, but then only exchange a certain amount or tell them this is how much they got. In Acts 5, it doesn't exactly say how he knew, but Peter, Peter calls him out basically the form, and, and uh, you see what happens to them through that story. But Peter made it clear the issue there was not that they wanted to keep some of the possession for themselves. He's not saying you need to give everything that you have to the church and to everybody else and let them share it. He's saying the issue here is you have a trusted fellowship and you're lying about it. Think about the power for, for bad or evil that a lie is. Marriages, parent-child relationships, friendships, business and church relationships are affected, even severed, every day as a result of lying. In a world where people are quick to lie and justify it even more, the unity of Christ stands around the utmost importance of walking in the truth. Secondly, Christian unity occurs when out of humility we put others before ourselves. The first step towards caring for others is asking God to change our hearts, to genuinely consider others as more important, and to genuinely care about their interests. And this, is a, this is a tough one for me because I think, yeah, I know this is what I should be doing, and yeah, I try to put people's interests first, and people, you know, other people first, but do I genuinely care about them? Do I have such a compassion that when something happens in their life and I, I'm aware of it, I'm made aware of it, that I care about it and I want to make a difference where I can? Consider Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with the humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. The next step in putting others first is simply being willing to ask them what they need, and then, if possible, helping to try to meet that need. Well, what if, you know, I can't possibly meet all of the needs that there are around me, or how do I discern if it's a need or a want? Some of that comes in building that relationship. But if you're unable to meet a need, whether it be a financial need or in some other type of need, that's why we have a body. This is why I'm so thankful that there are not, you know, a hundred of me running around. Because there are so many areas that I am inadequate or insufficient. So I need to find those individuals who are gifted in certain ways, which is referenced in our verse or our passage this morning. So seek out others to join you from the body here in, in helping uh, the needs of people. It's because we love each other so much, it's the only way we can truly put others first. If we don't truly believe that God loves us so much and that we love each other so much, that we can do that. When others come first, it isn't about winning. Even Jesus tells us that he came not to be served, but to serve. Lord, help us to consider the needs of those around us as more important than our own. Thirdly, Christian unity within a church increases in direct correlation with its spiritual maturity. Consider Hebrews chapter 5. Verses 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice 
to distinguish good from evil. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. And picture a grown, it can be a man or a woman, whomever you want. Picture, I'm going to say, picture a grown man. And he should be teaching other people. Or leading, showing, being an example. And yet when he walks in the door and sits down, he's drinking out of a sippy cup, preparing to re-enroll in preschool. Okay, you can open up your eyes. So, kind of a silly look. I mean, you, you don't... It makes me think of, I think it's the movie Billy Madison, that, uh, where he goes, Adam Sandler goes back in and, and goes through school again. And, uh, but spiritually speaking, that's how the author of Hebrews is describing the recipients of the letter. He's saying, to these, he's calling them out saying, you have been under the ministry of the word for a long time. But tragically, you are nothing but children. We don't become spiritually mature simply by showing up or because we grew up in the church. Rather, maturity happens when someone intentionally walks along your side and guides you through opportunities to constantly practice and reflect upon real life situations. That's going to help you learn how to discern. Go back to the last, Jeff, can you go back to the, um, oh, you got it up here, so sorry, go back, yeah. So this, it's this practice that helps us distinguish good and evil. And what do we feel like we're facing in this country? We're having a hard time people being able to distinguish good from evil. We're having a hard time sometimes in some of the doctrinal practices that some of the churches point to because they don't, they are not discerning truly what is good and what is evil. Shortly after preaching here, during my candidate Sunday back in February, one of the members pulled me aside. I remember this very clearly. We were in the basement, and everybody else, including my wife and kids, had left the room. I mean, you guys were all coming back up here to vote. And this person stayed behind. And they said this, you sure have an emphasis on discipleship, don't you? This passage is one of the reasons why. Our spiritual maturity individually and collectively is too important to go about it haphazardly or without intentionality. Too often, we help try to lead people to Christ, and then we leave them. We kind of abandon them and let them flap in the wind. And we don't carry through that salvation. This is a process. We talk about it. It's a process. But we need people that have grown in maturity to walk them alongside. We are not here to create more churchgoers. We're here to create more Christ followers. Because those who follow Christ understand that there is an importance to gathering together. That we are to still resume meeting. The spiritual growth of those, like my kids, or your kids or grandkids, or anyone that comes 50 years from now or 100 years from now, is too important. Are we going to just leave it to chance, or are we going to allow ourselves to be built up to make a difference on those who come behind us? Tell you what, I'm, I am thankful beyond belief for the apostles. Their teaching directly didn't come to me, but it was through their teaching. And then through Jesus, obviously, but had they not carried it forward, we wouldn't be sitting here. And all of the faithful generations that have come since. I saw something on Facebook the other day. That it was like, if you go back eight generations... It was like multiplying by two. You have two parents, and your two parents each had two parents. So there's four people that have impacted your life. And then you go back, and it was like within eight generations, it was like 4,096 people. And most maybe didn't direct, they didn't have direct impact, but they had indirect impact. Think about the millions and millions, probably billions of people over the 2,000 years that have impacted your life. And you don't even know it. You can't say their name because they were not directly 
impacted. But if they didn't impact the people that came before you, you wouldn't be where you are today. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote, How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one from whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can we sit here and listen to this verse, or read this verse, and not be passionate about our individual and collective call to verbally share the gospel and teach others to obey everything God has commanded? Yes, action. Yes, actions often do speak louder than words, but we need words. We need to verbally come alongside and say, this is this not good works here. I'm doing this because I have a Savior who died for me, who loved me, because I needed it. And that apart from his strength, I could not be doing this. Your spiritual growth requires, like mine, every day, requires very careful, uh, care, it requires a lot of care and attention. More than other growth. Tell you what, this is the last year I spent a lot of time focusing, this isn't growth, I guess, this is shrinking, but I spent a lot of energy and time on trying to shrink physically. Have I spent more energy in my spiritual growth? Have I cared more about that? Which really matters. However, it demands we humbly discern where our relationship with God is and to not think too highly of ourselves. Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So two, two important questions that uh, have really been a part of my life, especially over the last couple of years. And you do not have to raise your hand. I don't call people out to do that. It's just a question for the heart. How many of you would say that you have been intentionally discipled in your walk? When we asked, when the pastor asked us at the church we recently attended, I would say maybe 10%. I'm not talking about um, just listening to me talk. That's not discipleship. Did you or do you have someone in your life who's walked you along not only in the redemption that Christ provides, but also actively training and equipping you for ministry. Jesus' ministry would have been incomplete had he not told his disciples that they were to go and do likewise. While, it, while listening to a Sunday morning service is great, okay, you know, come, come here, I mean, I'm not telling you to, to not come, but we need other believers, other mature believers to listen to, to share with, to exhort, to encourage, and even rebuke us. Secondly, are you currently discipling others towards maturity and faith? And a natural question that always comes up is, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, I'm not going to answer that today. But what I can say is, if your answer to question one was no, question two is likely going to be a no. Because we can't walk through something that we have not ourselves experienced. We can't go somewhere where we've never gone. But it is out of our love for God and our love for one another, think about the two biggest commands that Jesus referenced, it is out of those loves that we must teach each other and bear with each other, sharpening one another to bring them to spiritual maturity. Second Chronicles chapter 30 says, The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. The NIV puts it this way, that they were given one mind. God's people were united for God's purposes in thought and in deed. When we are spiritually immature, as was referenced earlier, it is much easier for us to just be tossed in the wind of every doctrine 
or by human, human cunning, or by the craftiness of deceitful schemes. Furthermore, if we stay as spiritual infants, we cannot look out for the welfare of others. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Notice here, I, the part that's kind of, that, that sticks out to me is he, he refers to them as infants in Christ. But he still says, how can I address you as spiritual people? There's, again, something else at, at work. Paul is saying here that the, the walk of a believer is one of growth into spiritual people that helps us to see other believers as our allies and that we are comrades, in a sense, in the spiritual battle that we face. We cannot be lone wolves. We will get eaten up. We need each other, and we need to be constantly growing, or we will be swept away. Like any kind of growth, Christian maturity happens very slowly over time. This is typically not a wake up tomorrow when you're changed dramatically. Again, as we see in Hebrews, the mature are those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. We are to be constantly vigilant about the practice of our training. Training and constant practice are lifelong activities. And if we neglect them, we'll be doomed to perpetual spiritual infancy. Fourth, Christian unity occurs when we participate in God's shared purpose. Consider again John chapter 17, where Jesus was in the garden. He says that he was praying, excuse me. So Jesus prayed that the church would have the same unity that's displayed between the Father and the Son. So that, listen, here's the so that. When you see the words like so in the Bible, your ears should perk up. That's the what's the result? What's the result of having this unity of the Father and the Son? Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It is in the unity of believers through a love that we can only have because he first loved us that truly reveals who Christ is. It only grows as we display the same love to those in the world who we believe least deserve it. I want to share one other thing about when we were up here back in February. We were sitting over at Ron and Bev's house Saturday night, and I made a statement. I, I, I brought up the mission, and it can be found on the cover. It's also going to be up here on the screen. It says, to be disciples and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And I asked, was this more First Baptist's current reality or mere words on a page? And I followed up by saying, if hearts here were content with them being merely words on a page, choose someone else. Well, here I am. So we are here because, and when I say we, I mean Emily and the kids, and I, it's not just me. We are here because we want to come alongside of you and help you, equip you, participate with you, and encourage you to carry out this God-given purpose for each of us. We want to stir up a holy discontent with living solely in survival mode. Our mission statement is a reflection of the call on each individual believer's life that God gave us to love others and teach them about Him, the one and only one who can offer forgiveness and for those who entrust their life to Him. We do this, we are called to do this through the use of our gifts. We all have them. We've got to use them. Because my gifts are not going to suffice. Your individual gifts on their own are not going to suffice. We might be able to, you know, I might be able to strengthen the body for six months, but if, that's, if I'm not created to do that all by myself, I will weaken. This is why we experience burnout. 
because we have individuals or groups of people that, for whatever reason, are not engaging with their gifts. And so I'm calling on you today to say, you know what, I don't know all of your gifts. I don't know, many of you, I don't know what your gifts are. I've seen some, I see the ones that are on public display, but there are so many gifts that are unseen that are out there that the church needs, that God designed us that way. Grace truly is a free gift that costs us everything. When we live within this mindset, it allows us to understand that unity is not the same as uniformity. We have got to be able to separate that which is essential to the faith and that which is not. This is that majoring on the minors. Absolutely foundational to the Christian faith is an agreement on the sinfulness of man. Our absolute need for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that he is the only way to God. However, we must be willing to live at peace with differences in positions on topics such as the timing of the rapture. What church governing structure is in place. How we dress. What type of worship service we have. What we think about our human leaders or whether we wear a mask or not. The former examples are where we must speak boldly in the truth with love. The latter examples, we would be wise to speak slow with absolute authority, and when we speak, to do so with complete humility. Okay, hear me on this. How we carry ourselves with regard to our speech in the non-essential areas let me say that again. How we choose to carry ourselves in our speech in these non-essential areas that I just commented on often opens or closes the door to others being willing to listen to us speak about what is essential. We too often close the door on the things that, yeah, are they good discussion and are they worth our time? They sure are. But we fight over those minor things that are not essential, and that often closes the door. And I have seen it over and over and over again. I'd like to close with this thought. You know, it's been kind of a, a downer service in some ways, but let me just say this. Unity, think, I want you to change your mindset if you don't think this way already about what unity is. Unity is based more upon love than it is upon agreement. Say that again. Unity is more about love than it is about agreement. I disagree with my wife and kids all the time, but you better believe we have unity in the family because it's about love. We are to become a church family. There's a reason that we are called brothers and sisters and not, you know, eight cousins three times removed. In a family, when anything attempts to divide us, we are to seek resolution rather than to play the blame game or push them out of our lives or speak ill, will, or Ill words about them. Reconcile with one another. Do we love genuinely or has, God, or has our love for God and for others grown cold? If you find yourself with a division for whatever reason, Major, minor, I hear people say, well, it's not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal because you brought it up. Okay? If you deal with conflict in whatever way with a fellow believer, your first response should be to discern, where's your love at for this person? What's the level of your love you have for them? Are you willing to just walk away from them over whatever this is, or are you going to engage them and say, you know what? Here's what happened. Let's talk about it. Let's address it. Let's make this right. The way to unity is not circling the wagon with people who only see the world as you do, but rather loving others enough to live peaceably with them in spite of the fact that they may not see things exactly as you do. As we strive for unity based upon love, be reminded of Peter's words in his epistle. Above all, Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. May your walk with Christ be deepened so as to lead to the unity of faith that is so grounded in God's word 
that those who come across you will know that God sent Jesus to earth. We must not underestimate the importance of, of unity because unity within the church within sorry, unity within the church reveals God's love for the world and reveals the truth that the Father sent the Son and loved them even as the Father has loved the Son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, through Jesus you say to us that whoever wishes to be first must become the least and the servant of all. We leave this place knowing that your victory is won through Jesus defeating death at the cross. We pray that your church may be one. Teach us to accept humbly that this unity is a gift of your spirit. Through this gift, change and transform us and make us more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for the benediction, and again, just a reminder to come on out to Windmill Park at 1130, and uh, enjoy some fellowship. Brothers and sisters, we are one. The bread we share makes us one. The cup we pour makes us one. Even as our dearest sisters and brothers come and go from us, we are one. Even as we scatter from this place to so many different pursuits to, throughout the city, the state, this globe, we are one. With gratitude, we share the table. With gratitude, we depart. With gratitude, we release one another, trusting in the one who makes us one. Go in peace.